past CIFSAC recommendations can, can go fairly quickly and then maybe we can use the, the balance of the time to introduce the, the charter and bylaw discussion and then finish that up later on this afternoon. So if I don't hear a motion to the contrary, then I'll make an executive decision and I'll move ahead with that. So I, do you want to give us a, just a, a brief overview of the, sure. the recommendations and the current state of those recommendations, Wanda? Tab 9 in your uh, binders, and I apologize, I learned this morning you might not have gotten this in advance. Um, this uh, chart is either in the process of being posted or has been posted. We had some 508 compliance issues we learned around, about late. That's the federal regulation that requires all of the uh, postings on our federal websites to be accessible by all of the machine reading and uh, language conversion uh, software for uh, the visually impaired. So um, the members have a copy that is highlighted in blue or in yellow, uh, but the uh, version up on the website uh, will be you know, plain text, plain black and white for easier machine reading. So um, some of these are very minor uh, tweaks and uh, improvements or progress that's been noted um, on past recommendations. And uh, well, Dr. Coe very much wanted to zero in on one or two, you know, we were afraid that if he chose to do that, obviously we would have kept him all day as much as we would have liked that. Um, but he has seen this worksheet. He wants to see the department do better. He's like, why are there so many no's? Um, and, you know, we recognize some of this, some of what every advisory committee, you all are not unique, what every advisory committee suggests to the government, uh, sometimes they're, it, it's beyond mission, it's not strictly a federal responsibility, or sometimes things simply have diverged and moved on where a recommendation it's, it's not that it's no longer relevant, but it's beyond being implementable in that, uh, you know, in the language as originally proposed. So, um, you know, we do want to get to yes, advancing where this committee is uh, reported to have made progress. And while the official advisory committee website shows progress on, I think it's something like 18%, our tally is actually much higher than that. Uh, and that reported amount was done before we developed this chart to try to give us sort of a baseline and, um, you know, having a standardized method of reporting going forward. So um, if I, I think we're better if the committee wants to zero in or one or, on one or two or just take note that, um, you know, little things like the NIH State of the Knowledge Conference, Evelyn's been, or Eleanor has been talking about for some time now, and NIH has actually started taking those steps forward toward that 2011 conference. I think uh, some of the notes about CDC progress is because the, uh, you know, the data are in, they are beginning analysis, they're looking forward with changes in leadership, um, and even with declining level or declining funding, uh, in allocations, and all agencies of HHS have faced these kinds of pressures that budgets have been flat, the emphasis has been on things other than, in many cases, other than, if you will, the routine infectious diseases, the focus is bioterrorism and uh, homeland security and so forth, that uh, the important work we have to do to understand so many diseases and conditions is uh, leveling off or, in many cases, declining, sadly. So, um, you know, I think I would probably just stop there, let the committee engage where it would choose. Um, and ex officios, if you've got anything beyond what we uh, have noted here as well that would help us update, um, you know, beyond this meeting, that obviously we're always going to be working with the ex officios for those updates. But um, I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Dr. Jason, and then maybe if any of the ex officios have updates to this, uh, that they could provide us with, with any information that would be helpful. Dr. Jason. Yeah, just a point of order. Right before this conversation, we, we had a really fascinating discussion about kind of blood safety issues. And I was just wondering, if we were to make a recommendation in that area, when during the day 
be, you know, given the timely nature of this particular issue, would it potentially be scheduled in when we could actually come back to this issue? I, I was you can do it now. I was trying to channel somebody to be writing a recommendation while we were doing the preamble, and and then I hoped that as we concluded this discussion, which I, I think will take place before lunch, that we could get a recommendation on the floor that we could we, we could have a chance of acting on. Does that sound reasonable, it, Lenny? Yeah, yeah, I, I think. Uh, if you have one there now. I, 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 do, you, do you want to kind of deal with that now? Because the, the other issue, of course, is the recommendations, which we could deal with. You, you tell me how you want to proceed. I, I, I felt that I got a sense that people wanted to make a recommendation. I, I just, I, if well, we don't well, need a lengthy discussion well, about it, if we just want to get it on the floor, then. Well, well I, I'm happy to move a recommendation that uh, given the concerns for patient health, which Nancy so well said concerning blood volume, given the fact that this illness is something that we really don't understand what viruses or retroviruses might be involved in it at this point, um, that it's probably prudent to recommend that individuals who have either diagnosed or prior diagnosis of this illness um, not donate blood. So I, I'm, I'm hearing a recommendation that we uh, uh, any, any further discussion? My, uh, my question would be <clears throat> with respect to the, the issue of the asking, so that I guess there's different aspects to how it can be plated for the potential donor, and it's been done um, in different countries. So the question would be, would the recommendation be that um, with respect to our population, there would be a screening question, not a screening question. It would have to be volunteered, and um, certainly I'd, I want to open that up to the, the clinicians rather than myself as just an advocate. I, I, you know, you raise a very good point, because I can understand why you wouldn't ask the simple question. Uh, I, I, based on what was talked about earlier, someone with active CFS who can't get out of bed or who does things that if they, if they uh, exert themselves too much, they're paying for it for days afterwards. There won't be many of those people wandering through the, the donor center. It will be the people who have a history or, as Nancy pointed out, who are in remission uh, and have been that way for some time, who as simply a matter of public service want to do something for their fellow uh, human beings by giving a unit of blood. So simply asking them the question and then getting uh, organizations, support groups, getting information out there so that they know that this is not good for you personally and potentially it may be a problem for someone else down the line, uh, that would be wildly successful. And then this small percentage of individuals who maybe didn't hear that, simply asking them the question and having an information sheet to say, we would suggest you defer or we defer if you've had this condition. I don't know very many people that are going to lie about it and say, no, I've never had chronic fatigue syndrome. No, I'm perfectly healthy. Uh, when the information is out there as to why the question is being asked. But if they don't ask the question and they ask questions like, are you feeling well today? That's vague enough and so subjective that an individual may very innocently and very honestly answer yes to that and they filter through the screening. Um, so if you're going to make the recommendation, it seems to me that you're going to ask the question. Nancy. Uh, then Susan. It allows the opportunity and adds the difficult wrinkle that 85 percent of these patients have never been diagnosed. And so you have the opportunity to hand out a little educational brochure for the prospective donor to read. And then the question, did you read the brochure? Do you think you might have ever had that illness? That would be probably the most straightforward way to, 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 to get through that. But I don't think there's a single one word, one question you could stick on that questionnaire that would filter out this population. It would, they'd have to go through the eight, eight symptom criteria you can make the question three or four because you know, the insufficient fatigue people actually aren't very different than the sufficient fatigue. So three or more of the four symptoms and then uh, for a prolonged period of time. If you've ever had that, maybe you shouldn't donate blood. Susan, then I'll, 